Hello, thank you very much everybody for coming here today. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here uh, because The Carpet Weaver, which is my debut novel, um, I'm in the natural home. Uh, India is the natural home of this book. It's the only country in the world that has so far um, given me the chance to publish this book and share the story of this young gay Afghan refugee. Um, his coming of age story. It's a consular roman, which is a coming of age of a, of a young artist. And I'm happy to go ahead and start by reading, um, uh, reading an excerpt that's kind of related to the topic, which is basically an existence of an, uh, an American existence. You know, the ha being part of a community that's like having an overarching. Um, multiple identities, being both gay and Afghan and American and ex-Muslim and refugee, you know, these identities, how they conflict and clash, not only for Kanishka, but for me as an author. So while many people always ask how much of this is autobiographical, and I say it's considered this hashtag's own identities, if you're familiar with the term, is basically means that the author and the main character or the person who is the hero or the narrator the main na the narrator story both share the similar I or same identities so that's kind of where we are and i would say in um in terms of core values i would say my core values in terms of uh speaking up my mind and trying to emancipate myself, my own journey to do that has very much resonates with Kanishka's own journey in his life. But other than that, I was never a carpet weaver. I didn't live in Pakistan. I didn't live in a refugee camp. The rest of the world uh, is imagined. Uh, I did not grow up in Afghanistan. I was born there. I left when I was eight months old. And I returned in two, uh, after 32 years in exile in 2012 to be a professor at the American University of Afghanistan to teach international relations and political science. And I was persecuted there because uh, people had found out that I was a, la a lapsed Muslim and a practicing homosexual, so they persecuted me. And instead of just like leaving the homeland the second time, the first time um, my mother kidnapped us because she didn't want us to live, me and my siblings, in Afghanistan of war and communism, I was like, I'm not going to leave this country again and let the LGBTQI community <laughs> that are still criminalized to death there, I, I can't betray them. I have to speak up for them. I have been privileged, as difficult as my life was in the United States, I need to, if I don't do it, who is going to do it? So I risk my life to speak up <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was disowned by a lot of my relatives by my community and I received many death threats and curses and I ended up in a homeless shelter in New York City and had very difficult days but I'm here now I've prevailed <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry I'm just going to read from a passage here. So the passage I'm going to read for you is in part three. Okay, it's so from part three. It is from, uh, so Kanishka ends up in California and his friend Feis, who becomes an exotic dancer, takes him to this place where it's like a polyandrous place where couples are mixing and mingling and, and having sex. So he's, his Kanishka's good friend is actually an exotic dancer and he's ex seeing what American life is like and how sex and sexuality is played out there uh, in 1980s uh, you know, in California versus how it was in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, many people don't know, it's like an iceberg. So what the 90%, what you don't see, uh, just like in Indian culture and many Asian cultures, you have to be within the culture to understand it. So a lot of the uh, the, the, the sexual underground in Afghanistan was pretty much hidden and tucked away, but here we see that, you know, how it's like so in your face in Southern California. So I'll read from that section. One second if I can find it, because I had a book, I had a, I have a great assistant here, but I think he bookmarked it, but I don't know what happened. <laughs> so anyways, I'll go back to the page. How are you, Sharif? Yes. By the way, Sharif was the first person to have interviewed me when I came here last June for my book release. He was the first journalist to interview me, and uh, apparently I was the first person he invited too, right? So <laughs> it ends up, uh, you know, th life works in mysterious ways. So I'm happy to meet Sharif. He's a great person. And I've always told the young generation of LGBTQI people who've come of age now, post-Section 377, that 
you really owe a lot to people like, Sh the like the sacrifices that Sharif and other activists did to come out and risk it all, you know? So thank you for that. And thank you for putting on a good lit fest for us. So let's see here, where am I? I'm losing my, t oh, here it is. I have a piece of paper here. Okay, all right. Uh <coughs> Okay. After I had some time to adjust and feel strong enough to socialize, Feist introduced me to the LA social scene. Great restaurants and nightclubs populated the city. Angelinos could easily procure alcohol and drugs. I saw Feist to do drugs and alcohol. I partook in the drinking but steered clear from the barbiturates. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Vice had told me the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year were his, were his busy season, and I accompanied him, accompanied him to some of the parties where he performed as the strip tease for the night. The day after Christmas, Vice took me to a masquerade-themed party in Villa Park. The scene felt spectacular and surreal, like I had dropped into a Philistine version of 1001 Nights. F Fies flaunted his oiled up body and showmanship to polyandrous couples, eager to share their mates and amplify their love. I felt exposed since everyone wore a mask with their sexy costume while my face remained uncovered. I also covered too much skin for the occasion. The crowd of incognito men and women screamed, applauded, and threw feathers and glitter into the air as Fies roared along twirling tassels. He primped himself in burlesque fashion, like a steampunk. Gone were Feist's Groucho Marx impersonations. He was definitely still the life of the party, but not in a good way. I saw a side of Feist I hadn't seen before. I wondered how much sex he had, and if porn had become an addiction for him. While Feist danced, I could see in every jolt of his hips, his pursed lips, and gleaming muscles how delicate the dreams of Zaki John to raise a son who'd carry on his legacy really were. Here, Feist was minimized to an object of instant gratification of the most unsavory kind. I felt scandalized by this world of salacious showboaters. The shallowness that had infected Feist, too, equally bothered me. He had been the funniest student at Lycée Estéclal in Kabul, full of charisma, full of pride. But with his clever quips, silly antics, and sly comebacks, Fies was primed to become a successful comic who'd heal our nation and surpass Zalmay Ara as Afghanistan's foremost comedian. Not be diminished to this, when I tried to broach the subject one of, on one of our outings, Fies replied flatly, it's my choice how I wish to lead my life. Stop trying to control me. It's not that, I said quickly, not wanting to alienate my friend. I just want the best for you. Did I ever badger you how ab about why you're not attracted to men, why, how, why you're attracted to only men? My eyes widened. How did you know? You don't think I know about my good friend? As much as Faisa's glib re rebuff, bothered me, I still had no leg to stand on. You're right, I replied affirmingly. You've never told me how to live. I will respect your wishes. I pretended to fit into Feiss's world, but inside I had no desire to get along. I took my cue from the people surrounding me, though my reactions were obviously delayed. I felt qualmish and queasy when a woman in thigh-high stockings flashed her D-cup breasts at me. Since they looked so disproportionate to her petite build, I wondered if her rack was actually real or silicon. A woman in a wrap dress, probably older than Madar, stood behind me and said, What a cutie pie! as she softly fondled the back of my neck. Are you Af an Afghani too? she asked in a breezy manner. Even be behind her Venetian mask, I could make out her plump lips and rosy cheeks, and guessed that she must have had an easy and effortless life. I shouted in my head, I'm an Afghan, not Afghani, like the currency. But I figured I shouldn't bother if she had no conception about me or my nation. Besides, the unwanted advances reminded me of the time Lamba made me, made me get sexual with her. 
As, as unsettling as it was for me, the presence of the men in tearaway pants in the room comforted me. Their lustful glances reminded me of the men at Durrani Hammam. Only these specimens were comfortable showing their lust for one another in the presence of women. The tableau, the intense sexual verve, was unlike anything that I had previously seen or heard about, and it fascinated me. As a pious Afghan and Muslim man, I should have absorbed Mullah Naqib's strict precepts about the egregious violation of Allah's command. But I rejected the rigidness of, his, of, of my Muslim faith. How could I condemn others, especially when the world regarded me as a kuni, a sinner loving my own gender? But I was embittered to see these rich Americans so carefree and merry while my country was gripped by misery. An hour later, when the party gradually trickled to the backyard and people began skinny dipping in the lagoon pool, Fais and I took our cue and left. Some nights later, while en route to West Hollywood with Fais, my mind drifted back in time to when I was eight and Baba had taken us to a trip to the green forests and waterfalls of Gold Bahar in the north. On the way, we had reached a narrow road, pitted with huge craters and hemmed in by strewn rocks on the edge of the cliff that fell away to the rapidly flowing Panjshir River below. Ahead of us was a caravan of two humpback train camels trotting along laden with Gujar no nomad family. It was, it was an amazing sight to see all of their luggage strapped to pannier bags and saddle bags and trappings, dipping and rising to the gate of the caravan strides. The car in front of us grew impatient with the slow lope of the camels and honked non-stop until the lead camel grew nervous. It sprang out of control and the camels swerved off the cliff, sending all five camels that were tied along with their passengers, a woman wearing an indigo gown, jangling with glittering coins and jewelry, her children, a baby goat, a coochie dog, hens, cocks, guard dogs and lambs to plummet to their deaths. The vehicle in front of us sped away, while Baba stopped the car to console the man who had seconds ago lost his family. I remember we gave the man a ride to the provincial headquarters to enlist him to help him find th the remains of his family. Though we continued with our road trip, the image of the poor man who, would who had lost his entire life in the matter of a few seconds kept flashing through my mind. Ensnared on the Interstate 5 among a fleet of vehicles installed in traffic, I broke out of my meditation, fixating on the shimmer of red taillights in front of us and approaching with, ha with headlights from the other side of the center divider. I felt the blustery Santa Ana winds whip against my face. Fai snapped his fingers in front of me to get my attention. As we crossed the unmarked county line of the proverbial orange curtain and entered Los Angeles, Fai made a startling confession. It's my fault, he said. I'm responsible for you and my hand being separated. What? But you didn't do anything, I said. It's not your fault. Our nation went to war and every Breton scattered. It's not that, he said. You may never forgive me, never talk to me again. What are you saying? The reason why you and my hand are not together is because I snitched on Irfan and Usman that you two were boyfriends. That's why they started being so cruel to you at school. Why they sent you those, le those letters. You're lying, I said. You wouldn't do such a stupid thing. I did, I said. I'm ashamed. I had suspected something going on between the two of you. After Istalif, I, hadn't s I didn't see you very often and then felt sure you had left me out and I ran into the two of you at the, green, at, at the Chai Khana that one night. That day on Nauru's, I spied on you and my hand on the hilltops of Bagh Babur. I saw you two kissing. Then after the wrestling match, I watched you two argue in the, in the locker room until that friend of your Baba's walked in. I couldn't stand how you had grown closer and closer and left me out. Why are you telling me all this now? I asked, a wave of stormy emotions beginning to engulf me. It pains me what you went through, losing your Baba, enduring the camps in Pakistan. Is that what's really bothering you? I asked. Why didn't you tell me all this when I first moved to California? I'm sorry, he pleaded. I didn't think about it until the other night when you questioned my lifestyle choices. I know you said what you did out of genuine concern, and I thought what a great friend you'd been to me and how I had betrayed you. It sucks that I, kept, I keep messing things up. I should appreciate the life I've been given, but I feel like I'm throwing it all away.
I'm no closer to becoming an actor. I'm far ever from, from ever becoming a perfect man, from following the righteous path. I feel like I'm destroying everything. Thank you.